Well, this evening, in picking up where we left off last week, if you were with us, you recall that Christian had found himself at a very stately or majestic palace on the side of the way, and the name of that palace was called Beautiful. You remember, he had come to the cross and lost his burden, and upon continuing on the way, he met several individuals who either had a false assurance or should have no assurance, and by that I mean assurance of salvation at all because of the manner in which they were seeking to conduct themselves toward King Jesus. Uh, some were, you remember, some were sleep, uh, simply asleep in a delusion. Right, I see no trouble here. Some were seeking to go their own way, not going through the narrow gate, but climbing over the wall, holding fast to their traditions and formalities instead of uh, the way of the master. And then others were just running back to where they came from because of the perceived difficulties, right? I see too much danger ahead. I need to turn around. And as Christian himself climbed up the hill difficulty, continuing on the way, he himself, you'd remember, lost his assurance as he got tired and fell asleep as he rested in, at the arbor uh, there for the, uh, the rest of the saints. In his slumber, he didn't realize that his sealed document that gave him so much encouragement had fallen out of his hand. But upon hearing from those who were led by their fear of the difficulties they encountered, he reached in his coat to gain encouragement to, uh, to look upon his, his assurance uh, to find this document to, to encourage him on his way, and he discovered that it was not there anymore, to which he was greatly distressed. And Christian asked God for forgiveness for his great foolishness in falling asleep on his way. And in Christian's handling of the situation and his dealings with those whom he met on the way, we certainly see one who should have assurance of their salvation, one who should be assured that they very much are saved. Uh, though he fell asleep, as the others, uh, he did not justify his sleep. He got up and he kept moving. Uh, though he was fearful, as uh, mistrust and timorous were, running the opposite direction. Though he was fearful, he kept moving. He wasn't led by his fear. And upon his sin being brought before his eyes, he was broken over his sin Experiencing godly sorrow that leads to true repentance. Going back and getting his assurance at the place where he fell asleep and, and left it. And upon regaining it, he continued on his way. He continued back up the hill, continuing on the way. And as he does, as uh, we've mentioned, he finds himself at a beautiful palace. At a palace that, uh, that the name of is beautiful. To which he moves towards this beautiful palace hastily. He moves towards his palace with a quickness. Uh, he does so to see if it be possible that he could get lodging there. Uh, to see if he could stay there at this, at this beautiful palace. And as he gets closer to it, he sees the lions that the two cowards spoke to him about last week. And why they ultimately were turning back. We read that while the lions were chained, Christian was unable to see these chains. And he was afraid. He was afraid because of these lions that he saw, he actually considered in his mind of going back, just as the others did. And in seeing his body language and pausing and not continuing to move forward, uh, the porter of the house, or the doorkeeper of the house, the porter, whose name was Watchful, he cried out to him, and he said, Is your strength so small? Don't fear the lions, for they are chained. Uh, they're placed there for the trial or the testing of faith to find out where it is and to reveal to those who have none. Stay in the middle of the path and no injury will come to you. Stay in the middle. Nothing will happen. So Christian went on, heeding the directions of the porter. He trembled as he went, hearing the roar of the lions, but they did not harm him. He stayed in the middle just as he told him, and there was no harm that came to him. He clapped his hands for joy, and he went on until he came and stood before the gate where the porter was. And upon so, he said to him, and I quote, Sir, what is this house? What is this house? And may I stay here tonight? Ask him two questions. Sir, what is this house? 
and may I stay here tonight. And if you're reading along with us, you should know this, but I'll give you the spoiler alert and that he does get lodging there. He does end up being able to stay there. Certainly not without meeting a few qualifications first. He doesn't just walk in because he wants to. And I would present to you this evening that this beautiful palace still exists today. It will always exist, in fact. If you're a member of a church, you're a member of this beautiful palace. With that, this evening we're going to answer two questions. One of them I already just hinted at with a statement I made. But, are, but they are Christians' questions to the porter with the second one just posed a little different way for our context this evening. So the first one is, what is this house? As, as Christian asks, sir, what is this house? It's, what is this house? And the second one is, how do I truly get into this house today? As I've already stated that this house still exists today, this beautiful palace still stands. Uh, as Christian is seeking to get lodging there, how do I truly get into this palace as well, just as Christian is seeking to? That's all we're going to be looking at this evening. And then next week as we continue in this section, as he goes into the palace beautiful, we'll answer the question of what does life within this palace look like? What does life look like within the palace? So to begin, what is this house? What is this palace? Well, immediately upon Christian asking the porter these questions, the porter tells him, and I quote, this house was built by the Lord of the hill, and he built it for the relief and security of pilgrims. It was built by the Lord of the hill, and he built it for the relief and security of pilgrims. So this is a house, this is a palace, this is a dwelling place that the Lord Jesus built solely or completely for the purpose of his own. Completely for the purpose of believers, as the porter says, for pilgrims. What is this house? Well, beloved... In this palace, we have a more thorough picture given to us by Bunyan of the importance of what was pictured as Christian in, entered into the interpreter's house as well, which we saw then was the church. The interpreter's house showed us a kind of a function of the church. We are the interpreter's house where the word of God is taught. And this beautiful palace is representative of the church as well. This, this is the house that the Lord has made below. This is the house that he has built Christ says in Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church. I will build it. I will build my ecclesia in the Greek, my called out assembly. Those who have been called out of darkness to assemble together in unison. I will build my church, he says. Unlike other houses that are made with wood and brick and mortar, this house is made with ex-rebels who are called out of darkness into his marvelous light to assemble as the people of God. We are like living stones being built up into a spiritual house for God through Jesus Christ, as Peter would teach us in 1 Peter 2.2. So here in this palace, Bunyan continues to make it very clear that those who are Christian have not only been reconciled to God through Christ, but they've been reconciled to a people as well. Once you were not a people, once you were not, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. 1 Peter 2.10 uh, Those who receive mercy from God in Christ Jesus also become a part of his people. You cannot separate the two. If you've been given mercy in Christ and reconciled to God through Jesus Christ, you've also been reconciled to his people. You can't have one without the other. If you've been reconciled through Christ, you've been reconciled to the church. You've been reconciled to the people of God. We were once separated from Christ, as Paul tells us, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. Alienated, that word commonwealth has to do with citizenship. Alienated from the citizenship of Israel outside. You were strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, right, so that was then, before Christ, but now, in Christ Jesus, we who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Ephesians 2, 12-13. We're no longer separated. We're no longer alienated. We're no longer strangers. We're, we're in this thing. We're, we're in God's people. We, we, we possess his promises. We're within his household. The Lord Jesus says that he will build his church and he secures this reality, as Paul says, by a sufficient death for all his people on the cross. 
We who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. That's what secures the reality that we have indeed been brought into the people of God. Paul tells us uh, as well in Acts chapter 20 verse 28 when he is speaking to the Ephesian elders that God obtained, he obtained, he acquired his church by his own blood. By his own death, he obtained his church. And as we saw a Christian stripped of his rags and given new rich garments, beloved, it is the imputed righteousness of Christ upon his church that is definitely one of the reasons why this palace is so beautiful. This palace is beautiful because it's built of living stones that have been clothed with the perfect, glorious righteousness, never fading righteousness of Christ. Now you may find many beautiful pieces of architecture in this world. Many awe-inspiring pieces of architecture in this world. Beautiful and amazing palaces. Beautiful and amazing houses. But none are as beautiful as this house that the Lord has built. Beloved. None are as beautiful. And there's promised in the Old Testament through the prophet Haggai in chapter 2 verse 9. Where through the prophet, the Lord says, the latter glory of this house, speaking of the temple, where God's presence would dwell. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. This is promised for the Lord's temple. This is promised for his house. That the latter glory would be greater and beloved, as his house, his temple today is covered by the glory of Christ and his righteousness, we are immensely, immensely more glorious than any physical temple that has ever stood in Jerusalem. Immensely more glorious as we are the temple of God, the temple of the Holy Spirit, his dwelling place, his righteousness, the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ never fades a bit. Now, we certainly... If we were to judge ourselves rightly, we certainly have not done anything whatsoever to make this house beautiful. Amen? We've not done anything to make this house beautiful. For it is all of what the Lord has done in building it and taking us out of sin into righteousness that we can be useful as living stones in His palace beautiful to begin with. We did not make ourselves useful. He did. We didn't make ourselves beautiful in, in beauty that is truly meaningful. Or even if there's beauty on the outside, we didn't make ourselves that either. God did. God has done all these things. All things flow from Him. So, before we move on to how we get into the house, before we, how, do we, how do we truly get into this palace? Let's be clear that this is the Lord's house and that He built it. He builds the house. We don't build it. He built it. Which is why we, as co-laborers with God, ought to use the tools that He has given us that he uses to build his, his church, his palace, and make his palace beautiful in his word. We ought to use the tools that he has clearly revealed to us in his word. Uh, beloved, we're never going to come up with a better way to build his church than he has in simply proclaiming Christ and his gospel. We're not going to come up with a better way other than that. That is the means by which he has ordained to build his church. So we're not going to come up with a better way than him. The reason why there are so many ugly palaces professing to be palace beautifuls today is because instead of building with precious stones, they've been building with hay and stubble. They've been building with unbiblical means. They've been building with philosophies of man and not just the clear teaching of the word of truth. Pragmatism, just doing what seems to work, doesn't build the church. Beloved. It doesn't build the church. It just, it just builds ugly palaces that profess to be palace beautifuls. The Lord builds, builds the church. Just as well, uh, get a little more contemporarily in, in, our, in our time today, the governing authorities in the land do not build the church either. Governing authorities don't build the church. This was definitely seen in Bunyan's day with the established church where you would be given consequences if you did not follow the state-sanctioned church. The, the state would establish a church and you had to follow that church. It would be going against the state if you did not. It's definitely seen in his day, but it is... Yet still seen today in different terms, especially now. Uh, it's all this mess from COVID has come about. Uh, the civil authorities, however, do not build the church. They don't have the authority to declare what a church should look like. They don't have the authority to declare what qualities make up a church. They don't have the authority to declare any of that because it's not them that build the church. It is the Lord who builds the church. So 
regardless of what lions seek to stand in the way of Palace Beautiful to keep them out, to keep people out of the palace. Regardless of what lions seek to stand in the way, as long as we stay in line with the word of the Lord of the house, those lions, beloved, can never truly touch us nor harm us. Regardless of what lions are out here, we stay on the straight path using the tools that God has clearly given us in his word. Nothing can harm us, truly. Nothing can truly harm us. As the porter said, as long as we stay in the middle, not going to the left or the right, no injury will come. And at the same time, seeing those lines, we can praise God for those lines. Because they've been placed there by God, as the porter said, to, uh, for the testing of our faith. For the trial of faith. And we know that the testing of our faith produces steadfastness. A steadfastness that grows us into maturity, more maturity, as, uh, to, to make us into whole and complete Christians. And those lines are chained, beloved. They will only go as far as God allows them, as while they intend evil upon the saints, intend evil upon the people of God, God intends them for good for the purity of his church. God uses these lions who intend evil to purify his beautiful palace. You think about it, if those lions were not there, then the cowards, mistrust and fearful or timorous, would have continued to have an assurance that they never should have had. Maybe they would have got a little farther than they should have gotten because they weren't following Christ. They were following themselves. Seeing the importance of this palace and that there is only one way in, his way, it's the only way into his palace, we who are a part of this house, a part of this palace, should, as the servants of Christ, seek to protect its purity and its beauty as well. We should seek to protect the beauty of this palace. We understand that Christ works through means, and a part of the means that he uses to purify his church is the function of the church itself, is how the church functions as his church, as his palace. The church, as led by biblically qualified elders, must do exactly what used to be heralded in those old uh, Under Armour commercials. You remember that? There was a football team. They were in the weight room. The guy walks in. They're doing you know, the clap thing. They're getting hyped up. He comes in. We must protect this house. That's what we must do. We must protect this house. Amen. We must protect it. So the porter, the doorkeeper, we could say the elder or the overseer of the house doesn't say, well, come on in. You, you want to stay here tonight? Well, come on in. He doesn't say, hey, guys, we got someone wanting to come in. He seems fine to me. If you're in agreement, you can so signify by saying amen. Amen. He's in. He doesn't do that. Because he cares about the beauty of the palace. He's protecting the house. He asks Christian where he comes from. He asks Christian where he's going. Because he must protect this house. Where do you come from? Where are you going? And in this, Bunyan is describing... How people are to enter the church. He's describing to us how people are to enter into the church. How they entered into the church in the 17th century in his day. And honestly how they ought to enter into the church today. In contrast to how a lot of people are allowed to enter into the church. You want to hear someone's testimony. You want to hear their proclamation of faith in Christ. You want to hear their understanding of the gospel. You want to hear those things. Beloved. Rightly understood, since this house is for believers, remember the Lord of the Hill built it solely for the security and the relief of pilgrims because this house is for believers and that alone. When someone comes up seeking to be a stone of this house, a stone in this beautiful palace, we need to examine this stone, this stone to see if this is truly a stone that the Lord would have in his house. Is this truly a stone that he would have built? In this beautiful palace. Is this going to keep this palace beautiful? Or is it going to seek to put a stain on this house? So Christian tells him. And I quote. I've come from the city of destruction. And I'm going to Mount Zion. Well what is your name? Says Porter. My name is Christian he told him. But my name used to be graceless. I descended from the race of Japheth. Whom God persuades to dwell in the tents of Shem. Maybe you're thinking as 
Weston asked me when we were reading this together at the dining room table, what does that mean? What does that mean? Well, this is just another evidence of what was said concerning Bunyan. I think it, I think it was Whitfield that said this about Bunyan, but that if you cut him, he'd, be, he'd bleed bibline. He had so much Bible stored up in him. If you cut him, he would literally bleed uh, Bible, bibline, he said. Uh, but these are two of the sons of Noah. That's who these are. These are two of the sons of Noah. If you recall, Ham, the other son, uncovered his father's nakedness. I think it's implied there that he sought to humiliate or dishonor his father in some way there. And because of that, Noah pronounced a curse over his family line to be a servant of the lines of his brothers. But then Noah says in Genesis 9, verse 27, he says, May God enlarge Japheth and let him dwell in the tents of Shem. May enlarge this, this, this family line and may he dwell in the tents of Shem. So dwell in the tents of your brother. That's such a beautiful statement when you see in Genesis 11 that Abram or Abraham came from the line of Shem. Came from Shem, which means, of course, that Christ Jesus comes from Shem. So the blessing pronounced upon Japheth's line to be enlarged and to dwell in the tents of Shem is actually a picture of the Gentile nations coming to refuge in Christ. May, God, may, may, he, may he bless, may he enlarge your line and may they dwell in the tents of Shem. May the nations come to him. May the nations come to Christ. And this is what Christian is bringing about to the porter. My name was graceless. I was separated. I was alienated. But now I've been brought near. I've, I've found refuge in the tent of Shem. I found refuge in Christ Jesus. I've been brought near. I was lost, but now I'm found. And further, as Christian explains that the reason why he has arrived so late is because he lost his evidence sleeping in the arbor. The porter says this. He says, well, I'll call out one of the virgins of this place. According to the rules of the house, if she likes your explanation, she'll bring you into the company of the rest of the family. So not only is there the hearing of testimony, not only is there hearing of proclamation of faith that needs to be heard, but there's further conversation and examination to see the genuineness of this salvation as well before someone is truly led into this palace. We've got to make sure. We've got to protect this house. And as we are so thankful to have godly women here seeking to serve the Lord in the manner he would have them as godly mothers and godly wives and godly uh, nurturers, I, I don't believe picturing those whom the porter sends Christian to as women is meant to mean that there were women leaders in this house. I don't think that's what Bunyan is bringing about here. Uh, according to 1 Timothy 2, 11 to 15, that would be presenting a false view of Palace Beautiful. That would be presenting a false view of how the church functions. Um, but this is to personify the beauty, uh, as I'm seeing it, this is to personify the beauty of God's wisdom. The beauty of God's wisdom, as, as wisdom itself is even personified by a woman in, in the Proverbs. It, it is a beautiful thing, beloved. God's wisdom is beautiful, and it is pure, as these are beautiful uh, virgins uh, in this house. It is beautiful and pure. And it is that which is to be upheld in his beautiful palace. Now, this is another reason, along with the righteousness of Christ, beloved, that this palace is so beautiful. Because it is filled, not only is it clothed with the righteousness of Christ, but it's filled with the glorious, beautiful wisdom of God. So, upon the call of the porter, out comes a beautiful and serious looking girl named Discretion. Discretion. A discretion means a discernment or good judgment. Now, this is further bringing about the understanding that we need to have good judgment with who is brought in. We need to have good judgment. We need to have discretion concerning who is brought in to Palace Beautiful, to the church. So Bunyan tells us that she asked Christian where he came from and where he was going. And he told her. She also asked him how he got in the way. And he told her. Then she asked him what he had seen and met with in the path. And he told her that also. At last she asked him for his name, so he told her, It's Christian, and I have an increasing desire to stay here tonight, since by what I observe, this place was built by the Lord of the hill for the relief and security of pilgrims. So upon that, smiling, we read, with tears in her eyes, she said, I will call upon two or three more of the family. Let me call out two or three more. Loving what she has heard from this pilgrim, 
She runs to the door. She calls out prudence, which means to be wise, to be cautious. She calls out piety, means to be devout, to be, to be devoted to God. She calls out prudence, piety, and charity, to be kind, to be compassionate, to be loving. She calls out these three, to which these, after a little more discussion with Christian, led him into the family. They lead him in. Many of the members of the family then met him at the threshold of the house and said, Come in, you who are blessed of the Lord. The Lord of the hill built this house for the purpose of caring for such pilgrims. Then he bowed his head, and followed them into the house. And he did so because he himself obviously wanted to be in this palace and to be with other believers. Other believers that actually are, not, are living out what they're professing. And because of that, Christian was understanding of the questions given to him. As someone who loves Christ, beloved, should not be hesitant to speak of their faith. You should, you should be hesitant to speak of your Lord and of the way you came uh, to serve Him and of your love for Him and His truth. You shouldn't be hesitant to bear witness to the greatest treasure of your life. We live today in a very uh, much of an individualistic culture where it is harped upon so much that your relationship with God is between you and Him alone. Right? It's just, my relationship with God is just between me and Him. And the way that people mean that statement is just absolutely not true at all. If it was, the Bible would teach that. And if it was, I certainly wouldn't, wouldn't be agreeing with what Bunyan presents this evening. If such were the case, Christians should have replied, Why are you asking me these questions? You guys are coming off very legalistic and judgmental. You, you think you're better than me? Why are you asking me these things? My relationship with God is between me and Him alone. What, what is it to you how I got in the way and so forth and so forth? Beloved, there's definitely an individual aspect of our relationship between us and God. We are personally and individually saved. Yes, we are personally and individually sanctified by God through different circumstances that I may individually experience and you may not individually experience and vice versa. But as we are corporately and together brought into his church as those who have been individually saved, he has one relationship with his one church that consists of many members. He doesn't have different relationships with his one church. We're one entity. We're one palace. We're different members of one body. And as his church as a whole is to function a certain way, his way, the way of beauty, they are to be holy. They are to be without any spot or wrinkle. They are to be the palace beautiful. We as members of the palace have an obligation amongst ourselves and those that come around us to see to it that that is happening. So uh, to love God is to love neighbor. Correct? So no, your relationship with God is not just between you two in that aspect. Because your relationship with God very much affects your relationship with others. How your relationship is with Him affects how your relationship is with everybody else. And there are people that we've all been called to love, including you. So, from that perspective, no. Your relationship with God is not just between you and Him. It's between all of us. Because we're all living out this relationship with God together in the church. This is why the church in Ephesus, just for, for an example... That's so why the church in Ephesus is commended by the Lord Jesus in Revelation 2.2 for testing those who are calling themselves apostles or calling themselves uh, messengers of Christ but were not and they found them to be false. Why? Because those people calling themselves messengers of Christ's relationship with God is not just between them and God. It's between all of us. Because you're not coming into the palace beautiful if you're not actually a part of palace beautiful. They were commended, beloved, for protecting his house because that's what they're supposed to do. And praise God to be a, a, a part of a church that does seek to protect Palace Beautiful. Because we want our palace to be beautiful. Amen? We don't want a stained up palace. We don't want an ugly palace. We don't want to just profess to be something that we're not. Praise God to be a part of a church that seeks uh, to preserve the beauty and purity of the Lord's Palace Beautiful. And doesn't openly let wolves and sheep clothing in. And... In answering what this palace is and how one gets in, 
Next week, as I said before, we will uh, examine what life within this palace looks like, a.k.a. what does life within the church look like in accordance with uh, how Bunyan shows uh, Christian's time in the palace. But before I review, are there any comments or questions?